Okay. Um, welcome everyone um, to the virtual market design seminar. Uh, we are really happy uh, to have Nick Bidar today uh, presenting his paper on ironing sweeping and multivariate myelization. Uh, we're also very happy to have uh, Charles Zhang here, who is uh, going to discuss this paper after the talk. Um, let me just, before we get started, give you a quick reminder uh, of our seminar rules. Um, so you can unmute yourself um, to ask questions. Uh, Nick will take a couple of breaks throughout the talk um, to give you the opportunity um, to ask your questions. Um, after we get started, I will post a link um, to the slides. Um, so if you want to kind of look at the slides yourself, you can download the slides from our homepage. Um, moreover, um, as of a couple of weeks, uh, we are recording uh, our talks. So if you don't want to be on the video, um, don't ask questions. So that's pretty easy. Uh, if you want to ask a question anyway, uh, just put it in the chat and I will ask it on your behalf. Um, all right, so that's for the rules and uh, Nick, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I'm honored to, uh, to be presenting in this series. It's been great to, uh, to be able to watch all these, uh, these great presentations. Um, so this is joint work uh, with uh, Jakob Huri from UNSW uh, and Mingi Sun, also from UNSW. Um, so the problem we consider is that of a monopolist who wants to sell uh, an excludable uh, but non-rivalrous good. So it's uh, it's sort of half of a, a public good, um, but it's uh, it's possibly excludable. Uh, so you might think of this as as for-profit public goods, so goods that are are public but uh, but are, are sold for profit. Uh, you can also think of many mass-produced uh, goods. Uh, they would all all fit this framework. So, for example, things like newspapers, songs, movies, uh, smartphones, television. And even um, uh, sort of uh, academic lectures, uh, for example, is something you want to design for for possibly a mass audience. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the monopolist is going to choose a single quality that's going to be enjoyed by all consumers. So there's just going to be a single uh, a single quantity or quality uh, choice by the monopolist, and, and that same uh, queue uh, allocation is going to be enjoyed by all consumers at once. So they have to, for, for the entire market of N consumers, they have to choose a single queue. Uh, and the monopolist can restrict access to the good. Uh, this is going to be important, but for maybe half the talk, we're, I'm going to assume that uh, uh, everybody gets access to the good just to kind of develop ideas. Uh, but it's, um, uh, we'll, we'll go over how to reintroduce that to, to the model. Um, now, an important uh, uh, feature is that uh, buyers' valuations are going to be interdependent. So we want to, uh, because these consumers are all kind of sharing a single queue, sharing a single uh, quantity, uh, we want to ensure that they can, that their, their valuations uh, can depend on, on each other's uh, types. So this is going to be a mix of common and, and private values, and and these relationships can go either way. Um, you know, for a higher uh, if buyer I has a higher type, that may raise or lower uh, buyer J's value. So uh, one example I think we have in the paper is is about screen size on a on a, on a cell phone. Uh, some buyers may value a higher screen size. Some value, uh, buyers may uh, may want a, a smaller screen size. And so if uh, if buyer I's Type goes up, J's value may uh, may go down for the good. Okay, and so this problem is, is as a result going to be naturally uh, irregular. So uh, a regular environment in the in the mechanism design uh, literature just refers to um, uh, basically an environment where incentive constraints can can kind of be reduced a bit and then essentially ignored. So they can be essentially substituted out for. Um, and that makes the problem a lot easier since you can just solve basically an unconstrained problem. Uh, but this problem is not, you know, by, by assumption, it's not gonna have that feature. It's gonna be naturally irregular. Um, now there's, there's kind of two approaches uh, in, this, in this literature to dealing with these uh, irregularities or these uh, uh, non-montanicities. And the first uh, is, is what's called ironing, and that was, I think, pioneered by Moose and Rosen in 1978 and, and used uh, by Meyerson and many other people since. And this is a constructive approach that, uh, that kind of fixes the problem. 
but it's only useful for multi-dimensional cases. And since uh, our case, um, we have, um, you know, there's many buyers uh, whose types are feeding into the the overall uh, quantity uh, choice or quality choice. This is this is not going to work in our our multivariate uh, uh, environment. Um, to deal with uh, such um, irregularity in a multi-dimensional case, there's, there was something uh, invented by, uh, or at least uh, described by Roche and Chonet in their 1998 paper called sweeping, uh, which is uh, the, the second word in our title. Um, and this works for the multi-dimensional case, but it's not constructive. So the idea there is that you, you have some candidate solution and you use a, what's called a sweeping operator to decide whether or not it's actually a solution to the problem. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, a, you know, kind of a, a combination of these or, or maybe a, uh, an extension of, uh, of the ironing method is going to be constructive uh, multidimensional approach to ironing. And, and it's, um, it's going to extend something called majorization theory to, to higher dimensions. And it's going to be based on uh, based on Kuhn-Tucker theory, so based on sort of Lagrange multipliers and, uh, and Kuhn-Tucker saddle point problems. Uh, and the nice thing is that it's going to be implemented through a, what's a, actually a very simple quadratic minimization problem. Uh, so it's going to turn out to be a, a fairly uh, easy problem uh, in that it reduces to just uh, you know, minimizing a, a square function. Um, of the uh, what are eventually going to be uh, marginal revenues, so this is the the main difficulty we face. So just to kind of flesh out this uh, difficulty a bit more, I'll I'll describe a bit the problem uh, before I kind of go into the the model. Um, so the seller's problem is 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 effectively going to be cho to choose this this quantity Q here in order to maximize uh, profit. So here we have a, a cost function in Q, uh, and then Multiplying Q is uh, is some marginal revenue, and then um, the the uh, constraint is going to be that uh, Q has to be non-decreasing. And so you take a few steps from the original seller's problem uh, in order to get here, but this is essentially a um, an incentive compatibility constraint. So this is a, it turns into a monotonicity constraint. And so this you know if we ignore the monotonicity constraint, this is quite an easy problem. It's just a kind of quadratic optimization problem. And what we could do is just set Q equal to, uh, well, essentially equal to marginal revenue, but just in case we have negative marginal revenues, we have to add this max zero function. So just to make sure that our quality or quantity here is, uh, is not, not uh, negative. Um, so, so this is kind of the, the best case scenario. If the environment were regular, we could just just got to read off the answer uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but if this happens not to be uh, non-decreasing, if it's not incentive compatible, uh, it's not going to be incentive compatible if, if, this, if this marginal revenue term is decreasing in some uh, directions. Uh, so the requirement for incentive compatibility is that Q is increasing. If we set Q just equal to uh, marginal revenue, if marginal revenue is decreasing, uh, this is going to cause problems. And so what ironing does is it basically uh, reconstruct or it constructs a uh, an alternate uh, marginal revenue uh, that that has these this uh, monotonicity property built in. So it sort of builds in the the monotonicity constraint into the marginal revenue itself, into the kind of parameters of the problem, in order to return us to this kind of easy first order condition solution where we can ignore any constraints. And so. Uh, this is this is the approach we're going to take, and um, let's just take a look at how this might uh, might work. So here here's an example of marginal revenue. What marginal revenue might look like in our uh, in our model? Uh, on the left we have individual buyers, uh, and so the way these matrices work is that buyer um, buyer one's types go along the rows. So this row corresponds to buyer one's first type. This row corresponds to buyer one second type and, and so on. And buyer two's type uh, correspond to the columns. So a column is, is buyer two's type. And so what monotonicity would require, um, and so yeah, so each of these guys has a, uh, a marginal revenue that, that now depends on everybody else's type. So guys, guy one's marginal revenue depends on uh, buyer two's marginal revenue and so on. Um, and the, the seller cares about the sum of them. So there's a couple interesting things here to point out is number one, uh, buyer one's marginal revenue is 
well, both of these guys, marginal revenue are perfectly um, uh, uh, non-decreasing in their, in their own type. So if we go along the columns here, so increasing buyer one's type, we see we go from zero, one to two, that's increasing nine, 10 to 11, zero, one, two, these are all increasing. And along the rows, um, buyer two's type, uh, buyer uh, two's marginal revenue is increasing. But when we add these together, we get these, these non-monotonicities. So this kind of highlights one of the issues um, with the multidimensional case, or at least with our environment here, is that you can't, uh, you can't kind of do these, uh, do the ironing individually. You can't iron, say, buyer one's uh, marginal revenue, then iron buyer two's marginal revenue kind of separately. You have to do it all at once because it's the overall marginal revenue that's going to determine the properties that, that Q inherits here. Uh, so that's that's going to be important uh, in, in what follows. Um, and, and you might end up, uh, yeah, so you might end up with, uh, with a non-monotonic uh, marginal revenue uh, when you add them together. Uh, and so that's what we have here. So this, this is going to cause a problem, for example, when uh, the marginal revenue uh, decreases eventually for, uh, for buyer uh, one, uh, when buyer two's type is, uh, is the first type. So it goes from zero to 10 and then from 10 to two. This is going to be not incentive compatible. So that's the sort of thing we have to, uh, we're going to have to uh, iron out basically in, the, in what follows. Okay. Um, now, just to, uh, I'll show you, I can show you some pictures as well. So, for example, in the univariate case, if you had marginal revenues that, that kind of shape like this, had this behavior, what you would do, uh, what Moose and Rosen and, and Myerson would do here would just be to flatten it out um, where, where you have the problem and then kind of reattach it once, once it's been increasing uh, for long enough. So this is kind of the solution for the univariate case. And we can sort of see a, a solution for the uh, multivariate case as well here. So here we have uh, kind of two spots of non-monotonicities here. Uh, right at the very beginning, it decreases and then it goes up uh, and then it decreases again. And what you see again is, is similar to the univariate case. It just flattens it out here uh, and flattens it out here to make it nicely uh, monotonic. And then these can be used in the, uh, in the seller's problem to kind of solve an unconstrained, uh, unconstrained problem. Okay. Um, okay. So maybe I'll pause uh, to see if there's any pressing questions. Does anyone have a question at this point? Uh, didn't get anything from the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, well, interrupt me, I guess, if, uh, if you do. Um, okay, so yeah, so let, let, I'll go over the kind of the details of the model. Um, so we have n different buyers, little n different buyers, uh, and they have types denoted uh, with xi. Um, and the types are going to be drawn independently according to some uh, distribution f of x. Uh, so these are, uh, uh, these can be whatever. We have make no real assumptions on these, uh, these, these distributions. And just for a bit of notation I'll use a bit later, the highest type uh, for X is going to be denoted X uh, upper bar. The seller uh, to maximize profits uh, or revenues are gonna choose a, a quality or a quantity Q. I might also refer to this as an allocation. Um, they're gonna choose access rights. So uh, each buyer can be granted access uh, or not. Uh, these can be anything between zero and one. Uh, and then there's going to be transfers, uh, payments from the um, from the buyers to the sellers, and the buyers have utility that's based on uh, some function of everybody's type, uh, as well as the, the quantity quality choice and their access to the uh, to the the good minus the the cost of the good. Uh, the only assumption we make on V is that it's increasing in, uh, in or VI is that it's increasing in I's type uh, when you fix everybody else's type. So it may be decreasing or, or have different properties for other people's uh, types, but it's always increasing in I's own type. Okay. Okay. So here's the seller's problem. The seller wants to maximize uh, profit. So they maximize the sum of, uh, of the transfers they get, the payments they get, minus uh, some cost. Uh, this cost is just going to be, this could be any convex uh, function. Um, and this is a function of, of the quality of Q. Um, and so the, the, as I mentioned, the, uh, the monopolist is choosing uh, the quality, the access and transfers here. 
And it's going to be subject to incentive compatibility, which just says that the uh, uh, every uh, buyer has to be incentivized to reveal their true type. Uh, so the uh, the utility they get has to be uh, has to maximize their utility out of choosing any any possible type, and uh, and has to be individually rational. So all players have to get at least uh, or all buyers have to get a, a non-negative uh, payoff here. So as is fairly standard in, in this type of setup and in, in mechanism and design, we're going to um, uh, kind of um, substitute out for our incentive compatibility and inter individual rationality constraints using the following. Uh, sorry, Nora has a quick clarification question. Uh, sure. Maybe Nora, you can ask it yourself. Oh, um, oh yeah, sorry, that very, very quick question. Um, so there is no production cost per item produced? No, that's right. No production okay. cost per item. We're assuming it's uh, basically yeah, zero uh, marginal or zero uh, marginal cost for replicating this public good. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, as, as it's fairly standard, we can reduce, uh, get rid of this, um, uh, some of this uh, incentive compatibility constraint by choosing uh, the uh, transfers properly, and they're going to be equal to this this formula, um, and uh, and we have to ensure that the uh, quantity times the or the quality times the um, uh, the access rights is, is going to be non decreasing in in i. So in a typical when we don't see these access rights, it just has this allocation has to be increasing or non decreasing in. Uh, in each type. And so that's uh, kind of the standard. Just a bit of notation here. Um, this, uh, this delta operator, delta upper bar operator just takes the upper difference. So the difference between, uh, so if it's, if it's, if it's uh, operating on B of SI, takes the difference between the type above SI minus SI. Um, and so we'll have a, uh, another operator that has the uh, uh, sort of a lower, um, difference operator as well. Um, and at this point, I guess I haven't said anything about whether or not these types are discrete or continuous, and that's, that's somewhat on purpose. Uh, I think, uh, you know, typically in this talk, you can think of them as, uh, as, as discrete, but really I'm, I'm, we're choosing this notation a little bit carefully in order to, you know, preserve the, the idea that everything kind of similarly applies to the continuous type example as well. And I won't really go into specifics about the continuous type, uh, but in the paper we talk about how everything kind of follows through as well. Uh, so if you prefer the continuous type, you can think of this as a, uh, you know, a partial derivative, um, uh, but, uh, but you can also think of it as uh, discrete types. Okay, so we use this kind of standard proposition uh, in order to simplify the seller's problem as follows. So this is, is kind of like what I showed you already here. We have a, a choice of quantity multiplied by a sum of marginal utilities for all the buyers. Uh, here we have the um, individual access rights as well, minus the convex cost. Um, and I've, these marginal revenues are just defined as this, uh, uh, as this term here. So it's VI minus this um, what are known as information rents. So this kind of these, these bribes that have to be paid in order to keep the, uh, the buyers um, uh, honest, telling the, uh, telling the truth. And the, uh, the constraint on, on QI A to I is that the, uh, the, the product of those two has to be non-decreasing for all I. So this is the this is kind of the most general version of the seller's problem. Uh, I'll simplify things uh, in two ways here. Uh, first of all, we're going to set, uh, we're going to think of the public access case. So I'm going to get rid of the, where we had eight as before, I'm just going to set those all equal to one uh, and assume that um, we have public access now. Uh, and then I'm going to assume co costs are quadratic. So I'm going to get rid of the, the C uh, and set uh, cost to be quadratic. Now the the ADAs will take a little bit of work to get back in, but it's not too bad. And the costs, uh, as we'll see in a in a, a lemma in a few slides, uh, they're actually kind of inconsequential for our solution. In, in particular, finding the marginal uh, the um, uh, the iron marginal revenues is is going to be independent of whatever cost we choose, as long as it's convex. Uh, so it's we might as well stick with kind of the easy con uh, uh, quadratic cost here. Okay, uh, so this is a seller's problem. 
Um, uh, and I'll rewrite the, the monotonicity constraint using that uh, the, the operator here. I guess it's missing a, a subscript i, but this should have a subscript i on it. Um, so it should be uh, the the difference in i direction should be positive everywhere for all for all i. So this is just replacing the monotonicity constraint with something a bit more um, operational. Uh, and then we're going to turn this into a saddle point problem here. And those those constraints are, are going to be multiplied by uh, uh, Kuhn Tucker um, uh, coefficients here. And we just add those all to the end of the problem to get our, our saddle point problem. So now we're going to minimize over these lambdas uh, and maximize over, over the Q. Um, so this is just adding in those, uh, those constraints there. Uh, then we'll manipulate this a bit. Uh, uh, We'll go from uh, from this this term that has a delta on the Q to a term that has a delta on the the lambdas here. This is a, basically just a uh, sort of a, a like partial sort of like partial integration, except in a, a sort of a discrete form. Uh, so it's going to give us a, a minus sign here, and it's going to apply the difference operator to the lambda. And here we have the lower dis uh, difference operator, um, and so we get. Uh, where the lower dif uh, difference operator says subtract uh, if you're subtracting against um, you want to subtract off the lower uh, type one type lower than the, than the argument here uh, and just to clarify the top um, the, the top uh, multiplier here the multiplier on the highest type is, is going to be zero so there's no constraint on the um, on Q when when uh, X has the uh, higher when uh, I has the highest possible type, and so we're just going to set that uh, that multiplier to zero. Okay, so so now this is in a, a slightly more useful uh, form. We can actually bring this into the um, uh, into the the summation and as well as into the uh, expectation, and so it's just going to be. Uh, what looks like a kind of an adjustment term for the marginal revenues. So what we have here is, is Q uh, times the sum of, of marginal revenues. Uh, and where those marginal revenues are now adjusted by, uh, by this, this amount here. Um, and the reason, you know, the reason that I point this out is because this happens to actually coincide with, uh, uh, with a definition of, of something called majorization. Uh, so it is said that this each of these uh, terms for each i majorizes the original marginal revenue in i's direction, and I'll show you in the next slide what uh, what it means to majorize. But the reason why this is important is because majorization has this you know, very old uh, and, and large literature in mathematics, uh, and, and so it gives us a lot of tools for thinking about you know thinking about functions that are, are ordered or partially ordered by this. Uh, uh, by this, by this um, ordering, um, and so it can be. It's going to be very useful in, in kind of coming up with tools to get a, a good sense of how this uh, um, how this problem is, is going to play out. Okay, so what is uh, what is majorization? So we'll come back to the saddle point problem after we discuss uh, exactly what majorization is. Um, so if you take two functions defined on the uh, set of types say G and H, we're gonna say G majorizes H in each coordinate, uh, each coordinate I, uh, in coordinate I, which will denote with this kind of squiggly uh, inequality sign here, if two things are true. Uh, one, uh, for any type uh, of, player, uh, of player I, um, the lower sum or the conditional, ex or the expectation conditional on being below that type for G is less than the same conditional expectation for H. So it just says that the lower sum uh, for G is lower than the lower sum for H. Uh, and then the second requirement is just that the total expectation or unconditional expectations are, are equal here. Okay, and, and maybe a, a picture would be useful. This is, these are the um, functions Nick, we saw uh, before. Sorry, uh, here we, we have, have a... G in, in red, uh, it's flat and then it's, it's increasing. And G is going to be said to majorize H because the lower sums of G are lower than the lower sums of H, which we can we can plot as well. So here we have the lower sums of uh, of G, and you can see they're everywhere decreasing, and then it eventually meets back up with uh, with H, the lower sums of uh, H, and so it, it's equal at the top uh, as well. So this is what uh, univariate majorization. Uh, uh, is now this is not quite sufficient for our purposes. Well, no, before I say that, let's just um, go over why uh, 
in fact, our adjusted marginal revenues uh, are majorized the original marginal revenues. Uh, Nick? And that's, these are just properties of these, uh, these Coombe-Tucker uh, coefficients here. Uh, so we can take the lower sums and confirm that the lower sums of the adjusted marginal revenues are, are less. Uh, and to do that, we just take this, uh, these adjustment terms outside of the expectation. So we just get the sum and these are just differences. So the sums all cancel out except for the very last uh, lambda here. And so this, these lambdas again being uh, uh, multipliers, uh, uh, constraint multipliers, they're gonna be non-negative. And so we can conclude then that the, uh, the, the adjusted marginal revenues are in fact lower, have lower, lower sums than the, um, uh, than the original marginal revenues. And then they're also equal at the top. Uh, we can see that as well, uh, just by recognizing that this, this top multiplier is, is gonna be zero. So once we take the, the unconditional expectation, all we're left with is this, uh, this top uh, highest lambda and, uh, and that's zero. So we get uh, the equality here, okay? And so the, uh, indeed uh, we can see that the adjusted marginal revenues are majorizing the, um, uh, the uh, original marginal revenues, okay? Now, this is not going to be quite enough for, uh, for our purposes, since as we kind of saw earlier, the, it takes a, um, a kind of a more global approach. So we don't want just individual uh, uh, majorization. We want kind of a more uh, global majorization over all dimensions at once. It's gonna take a more integrated approach. And so what we need is a, a concept uh, that is kind of truly uh, multidimensional or multivariate. And to do that, we basically just sum up over all the buyers and, and think of a new multidimensional concept of a, a lower sum. And in that case, uh, what we have here is gonna be a sum of these functions over something called a lower set. And I'll show you a picture of a lower set next, but that's, uh, that's basically all, all there is to this uh, multidimensional multivariate majorization is just kind of summing over all possible buyers. And, uh, and ensuring that the lower sets, uh, the, uh, the uh, majorized, um, that the, the majorizing uh, function has lower, uh, lower sums over lower sets. So everything different here is just highlighted in red. Uh, and so we're replacing the, the lower uh, sums with these um, lower sets here. Okay, so what is a lower set? Basically a lower set is any set that includes all points that are lower than any point uh, included in here. So if, if X is included in a lower set, uh, then everything less than X has to be included in it as well. So here are some examples of, of lower sets. Um, and so when you sum over all these, you get that same idea that the, the only uh, multipliers you end up with are the ones at the kind of at the very edge. And that gives you, that, that allows you to basically sign the difference between the adjusted and the original marginal revenues. Um, and so this is kind of the key to our, our definition of uh, multivariate majorization. Um, and so now, instead of taking sums of just everything that's lower than a particular type, we want all sums of all, uh, uh, all types in a particular, uh, in all lower sets, okay? And so that gives us our definition of multivariate majorization. Uh, so that's it here. So if we have two functions, G and H, uh, defined uh, on the type space, we'll say G majorizes H. If for any lower set, uh, the expectation of G over that lower set is less than the expectation of H over that lower set, and overall the uh, unconditional expectations are, are equal. So this is the, uh, the concept of uh, multivariate majorization we, uh, we have in mind. Okay, so I think that's a good Point to All pause, right. So maybe this is a uh, good, good, good point to pause for questions. Uh, does anyone have a question? We had a clarification question like 15 okay. minutes back. Okay. So um, uh, we can return to the, let's return to the saddle point problem here. So this is where we left it. Uh, we have Q multiplied by this, the sum here. And the sum is, is as we, we know now is, uh, is, is majorizing the original marginal revenue. Uh, minus the, uh, the quadratic cost function here. Uh, so now I guess one thing to note here is that the interior maximization problem is now fairly uh, straightforward. There's no uh, constraints on it, uh, except that 
you know, QS to be positive, uh, but that's not really going to uh, be an issue. And so we can just plug in the first order conditions for this. So the first order conditions, because of this quadratic cost, are just that Q has to be equal to the max of zero and uh, this, this sum here. Uh, and so we can plug that in. Uh, and once we do that, the saddle point problem simplifies, we get rid of the interior problem and we have the exterior uh, minimization problem still, but it's just a, a, a minimum uh, over this expectation, uh, which is just a sum of the marginal revenues, original margin revenues minus this adjustment term, and then all that squared. So it's just this, this fairly simple uh, quadratic minimization problem. And to uh, relate it back to the majorization, uh, idea of majorization, uh, I'll uh, rewrite it in one more way here. Um, and so I'll get rid of, let's see here. So I'm gonna replace the, uh, the lambdas, replace this whole term uh, with a, a function G, which I'll call G. And then the requirement or the constraint uh, is now that uh, G has to majorize uh, the marginal revenues. So we're just choosing some function G that majorizes the original marginal revenues. Uh, and so we wanna minimize this quadratic uh, expression um, by choosing a, a majorizing G. And I made one more simplification here and I just dropped the, um, the I subscript uh, so I don't have to keep including the sum here. So we just have this, this MR uh, is just gonna be the sum of MR. So we wanna find a, a G that majorizes the sum of all the, uh, all the MRs here. Okay. Now, I, one thing, uh, so this, this looks like a very simple problem. And uh, at this point we can talk about where, you know, where, uh, how it might be different if, if we had a C, um, a, a kind of a more general convex cost function. So you wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't get this, this square here. Uh, this is coming directly from the, the quadratic cost function. Uh, you get a much more, complicated expression, but the important thing, it would be, it would still be a convex uh, uh, function. So here G is, a, or the, we're minimizing a convex function of G here. And so you would still end up with a convex function, um, uh, minimizing a convex function of G if, if I had left that, uh, uh, that, that cost in there. And this, uh, this lemma I'm gonna present now is, is important because it says that, Basically, that that um, simplification of using quadratic costs instead of con just the general convex costs uh, was with no loss of, of generality up to this point. So it's going to make a difference for the saddle point problem, but in terms of finding the ironed uh, marginal revenues, it's not going to uh, make any difference at all. Um, and so what the lemma says is that if if we have some marginal uh, some adjusted marginal revenues or iron marginal revenues. Uh, that solves the quadratic minimization problem, then it also solves the uh, uh, convex minimization problem for any convex function. So this is a, a sort of a somewhat of a standard result in the univariate case, and, and we've extended it to our uh, multidimensional uh, matrization uh, case. And so this is really uh, uh, what's sort of a powerful result in our environment, since it lets us basically make uh, decide what these marginal revenues are going to be independently of C. So once we, we can kind of ignore C uh, for the most part and, and get a lot of information about what the allocation should look like. Um, and so as long as we have a convex function for C, we're going to be able to apply this lemma. And this, by the way, also allows us to get rid of this kind of annoying uh, max zero function. We can ignore that as well, since that's a, a convex function. And we can just take uh, the solution to uh, to this simple quadratic minimization problem. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an uh, easy way of, of kind of getting rid of C, okay? Okay. Okay, so for any C then, just to summarize, our marginal, our iron marginal revenues are gonna be the, the solution to this very simple uh, problem here. And it's written in terms of majorization and we would uh, operationalize it by kind of plugging back in these, these lambdas and, and solving for the, the lambdas. Uh, but, uh, but this is essentially what the, uh, the problem looks like. So a few things about this, um, these marginal revenues. First of all, the solution exists. It's just a, a quadratic minimization problem. So it's a, a unique solution that always exists. 
Um, second is it's gonna be non-decreasing in all directions. So it's gonna be well behaved uh, in the way we want it to. Um, and it's going to be, uh, it's gonna be minimal in this, uh, in this, in the, you know, the constraint set. So the set of functions that majorize uh, marginal revenue, this MR is gonna be the smallest one in there and with respect to the majorization order. So there might be very, there might be multiple um, smallest elements in this set, uh, but um, uh, this, uh, this one we choose is gonna be, uh, is gonna be a smallest element, the minimal element. Um, and it's also going to form level sets uh, or the level sets of marginal revenue, uh, iron marginal revenue are gonna form orthoconvex partitions. Uh, so what is an orthoconvex partition? I'll show you now. So suppose you have a, a, a type set that looks like this. So we just have a bunch of discrete uh, types for two different players. Um, two different orthoconvex partitions would look like this. So as long as you can, um, a, a partition is gonna be orthoconvex if for any cell you can draw lines parallel to the axes uh, and, uh, and, and contain those lines entirely within the, uh, the cell. So um, you sort of have this, this uh, um, overlap of, uh, of intervals uh, for each, each player here. Uh, and so it's not necessarily gonna be convex, but it, it will be ortho convex. So for example, this, this cell here uh, is not convex since you know, this point here and this point here, um, the convex sum uh, includes these two points here, but this is ortho convex uh, because you can kind of, uh, in any orthogonal direction, uh, you completely uh, stay within that same, um, you never leave that, uh, that cell. So these are just two examples of orthoconvex partitions. Um, and within each of these cells, so this, this process of uh, ironing is gonna generate these, uh, these partitions. And within each of these partition cells, you're gonna get a constant level of, uh, of marginal revenue. And that marginal revenue is just gonna equal the expected value of the original marginal revenue uh, on, that, on that cell, okay? Uh, so this, this ends up being a very uh, clean structure uh, to these, uh, these marginal revenues here. So let's take a look at, at an example. This is the example I, I, I started with before. We have these decreasing uh, marginal revenues. Um, and, uh, and, and this is the, the process that, uh, that we're going to take. So uh, I'm just going to highlight uh, the areas that, uh, that we have problems with. So this goes from 10 to 2, 20 to 12, and 12 uh, to 4. So this is going to be incentive, not going to be incentive compatible for, for buyer 1. Um, and similarly for buyer 2, we have, uh, we have similar issues here. And our, our uh, uh, minimization problem is going to produce this uh, marginal revenue here. So it's going to, this is the partition. So to, to generate this partition, you just take, uh, you just overlap, overlie all the, um, uh, where all these uh, highlights are to create your partition cell. So this has four different uh, cells here. Zero is its own cell. And then you have the six, 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 and the four twelves here. And in each of these, each of these cells, as you can see, it's uh, completely flattened out. Um, and, uh, and this should highlight as well that, uh, that you need to kind of do this, you need to do this majorization, you need to do this ironing um, for all players at once, uh, since you know, if, you, if you just kind of did it for player two, you might, you might set these uh, constant within each of these cells, uh, but that's not going to uh, uh, be correct overall. So you have to do it uh, all at once here. And so you get the, this constant, uh, constant function within each of these cells. And just to give you a sense of what the, uh, these uh, adjustment terms are, are doing, uh, I've, I've listed them here. So in each case, you're subtracting four uh, from each of the mineral uh, types uh, and, and adding it to the, uh, to the final type here. Uh, and that, uh, and you can see, you know, these, the problem is that it, uh, it, it's too high and then it, uh, it's too low. And so if you add, if you subtract from the higher one and add to the lower one, you're gonna to start to even things out a bit here. Okay. And so we can get our, our complete characterization here. We just said Q star equal to C prime inverse. So we can bring back this C here uh, and we take the max zero of these iron marginal revenues. Um, 
and uh, where this, these iron margin revenues follow from this simple uh, quadratic ma uh, minimization problem. And then we set the Ts equal um, as usual. Okay. Um, now, to give a sense of how restricted access rights can help, we can revisit this, this uh, previous example here. Um, so what we did was we flattened, you know, let's focus on this cell here. We flattened 10, two to six, six. So this, um, you know, if with quadratic cost, this is also going to be equal to uh, the allocation. So what the monopolist has to do is reduce the allocation by 40% in order to satisfy buyer one's uh, incentive compatibility here. And if we take a look at player one's marginal revenues, they're, they're fairly small. So uh, the buyer or the seller is forced to cut production uh, below what it, you know, in a perfect world, it uh, in the first best uh, case it would do, it has to cut uh, production quite a bit below that, um, only to gain, you know, buyer one's uh, incentive compatibility. And buyer one's not really contributing much to marginal revenue. Most of that's coming from player nine, or from player two, buyer two. And so this this kind of highlights how important these restricted access rights are going to be. Uh, the, the seller uh, would like to just kind of ignore buyer one and focus uh, a little bit more on buyer two uh, to get as much revenue from buyer two as they can. So they, if they could exclude buyer one, that would be uh, quite useful uh, in, uh, in increasing their revenues. And we'll see that's, that's pretty much exactly what they'll do. Uh, and I'll skip going through the saddle point problem again, uh, but it, it basically, once we add back these, these ADAs, uh, it, it boils down to somewhat of a similar problem, except uh, now we have um, the, a slightly more complicated expression. Uh, and so what we have to do now is, is majorize uh, on an individual le uh, level. So we want to make sure that these individual marginal revenues are, are majorized. Uh, but we're still choosing the, or iron, we're still choosing the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the majorized, uh, the iron marginal revenues kind of in a single problem. So we can't do these with n different problems. We have to do them all at the same time, uh, but it still kind of reduces to a fairly uh, simple problem. Uh, so this is going to be what's, what's gonna be solved in order to get the uh, iron marginal revenues. And you can still do this independently of costs when you have these uh, access rates. Okay, and so the optimal mechanism is just going to be to solve this problem. So we, we minimize against a, a quadratic um, optimization problem, uh, use these, uh, these new kind of um, uh, marginal revenues, these iron marginal revenues, plug that into your cost function, your inverse cost function, and then you set uh, your ADAs, uh, your access rates optimally. And to do that, you, uh, you wanna make sure that uh, for any, if, if your marginal revenue, your iron margin revenue is negative, you don't grant access. If it's positive, you do grant access, complete access. And if it's zero, you set access uh, to be, uh, it can be basically any number between zero and one, but we have to choose it in a way that, uh, uh, that, that makes, um, makes uh, Q eta I constant in X I on each cell of the partition and non-decreasing overall. And then we set, uh, um, uh, transfers to be um, uh, incentive compatible. And so just looking at our example before, uh, we end up with something that looks a little bit different uh, in that it's no, it's no longer uh, flat on these regions. Uh, so it happens to be that the partition is still the same. That's not necessarily always the case, but in this case, the partition's the same. Uh, but here it's no longer strictly, or it's no longer constant. It's actually decreasing um, in, uh, in, in some types. And that's fixed by using uh, fractional ADAs here. So a probabilistic access rates will kind of smooth that, uh, these incentive problems out. Um, so that is, uh, so that's why, um, so, so this is uh, yeah very helpful to the uh, to the seller to have these uh, probabilistic access rights. This allows the seller to kind of get the most out of in this example buyer one's uh, marginal revenue without kind of sacrificing uh, uh, the revenue it would get from buyer two in in for example this uh, this case here when uh, buyer one's type is two and buyer's two type is uh, is or buyer one's type is one and buyer two's type is zero. Okay. 
Um, okay, so this, uh, yeah, so we, we've basically developed this idea of multivariate majorization using the Kuhn-Tucker problem. Um, and it's importantly applied to both excludable and, and non-excludable goods. I think this, uh, it's, it's worth uh, emphasizing that the, um, the access rights can be, can be solved for uh, quite easily as well. Um, in the paper, we, we look at continuous types and, and that kind of allows us to relate the sweeping operator to um, a stochastic operator defined in the majorization literature. Uh, so that kind of takes care of the, um, the, the title of the paper. Um, uh, it makes sense mostly in, in continuous types. And in the future, we're, we're looking at, you know, how to use this multivariate majorization to generate a, um, a, a order, a second order stochastic dominance uh, relationship over um, uh, probability distributions. So that's sort of a, a, future, a future project for us. And, um, yeah, so uh, any questions or? Um... Uh, Nick, just one question. Can you hear me? Nick? <laughs> Nick, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you oh. can hear me, but you cannot hear, hear Vitaly, right? I can't hear anybody else, <laughs> just you. Okay, Vitaly, I'm going to take over. Obviously, it can okay. talk on you. Um, just before to start the discussion with uh, with Charles, uh, there are questions from uh, Muli Modak. So maybe Muli, you want to ask your questions now? You can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Nick, can you can hear, Muli? hear me? No. Okay, um, Muli, if uh, Nick cannot hear you, that we can do is to put you in touch with the questions. I think we can <laughs> sure. hear her, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so sorry. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, Nick, you can still hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, Muli, let's, let's make another shot. Can you try to speak? Hello? Nick, you hear? No, nothing. Okay, uh, okay, so it doesn't work. So this <laughs> is a statement. Uh, there is a technical problem. So Muli, Nick, we will put you in touch because there okay, are sure. questions. Uh, um, so no problem with that. Uh, uh, let's hope that uh, that uh, Nick can hear Charles for the discussion. Hello, Nick. Can you hear me? Nick, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, Nick, you don't hear Charles, right? No. I don't. Um, let's try something. Uh, let's try that you... Um, okay, so okay. let's maybe start with the question of Muli and then we, we go for the discussion with Charles. Uh, so I, I had a question I might uh, actually in the beginning I was not there so maybe uh, I missed okay. it. So the only question uh, questions I had was uh, why are there finite number of buyers? Um, yeah, well, I guess that's we're just sort of sticking to the the standard um, sort of Meyerson setup with a, a, just a, a finite um, number of buyers. I wouldn't, I don't know if that makes a, a huge difference. I'm not, the majorization literature, yeah, typically assumes sort of a, a finite uh, um, uh, a set of, uh, of, of uh, not players, but uh, they would consider it finite as well. Um, yeah, did you have something in mind that? Uh, no, uh, I was thinking like usually this, I mean, you don't know how many consumers you might have. I mean, it's, right, isn't it yeah. usual to assume it's you count can't count it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in the in the mechanism design literature, it's, it's I think it's fairly standard to have uh, sort of a finite uh, known number of uh, of players. Uh, I'm not sure if I've seen much that has kind of a an unknown uh, uh, number of, uh, uh, of of buyers. But I think that yeah, that could be an interesting. Yeah, if I may um, say something, uh, Nick, uh, I, I think uh, I think actually in your model, you might not even need to restrict to finite the number of buyers because uh, here is a public good problem. So the mm -hmm. question is whether to provide the public or not and how much to, of the public good to provide. Mm -hmm. So it's not in, you don't need to worry about the ETA problem in auctions. So uh, right, I yeah. think that Olic might be right. Okay, yeah, I see. 
Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Thank you, so let's keep going with the uh, chat. I think Vitaly, you can go back for the moderation now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Charles, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you. I uh, try not be, to be long-winded. So, uh, but I have to. You have to help me to keep track of the time. Uh, so I have this problem. Um, so, um, I am quite interested in this paper apparently, and then um, it. Uh, it derived the uh, it derives the ironing procedure uh, through the settle point condition, uh, and it suggests a connection between ironing and majorization, which I learned. This is something new I learned, and um, it also uh, provides an extension of ironing and majorization to multi-dimensional space. Now, just to clarify. The authors are restricting attention to unidimensional types. So that's different from Roche and Chonet. But because of the interdependency of valuations, the multidimensionality would come in, not through incentive, but in the ironing of the, um, uh, the virtual utility function, what they call the marginal revenue, which was really illustrated beautifully just now in the talk with the examples. So it is indeed non-trivial, despite that the uh, dimension of types is one. Um, and so a lot of this uh, does not require repetition because uh, Nick has presented. So here my discussion will focus on the main case where uh, the type space is a finite set. And um, so the, here the only thing that I want to emphasize is that a main uh, assumption they have is about the incentive compatibility is about exposed. And then um, the paper will start with procedures that we are quite familiar about, except that this is uh, based on the discrete operation rather than the uh, usual uh, uh, envelope theorem and integration by parts, but really this is the discrete counterpart of it. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, I, I like to use a single set letter and then so I use V to denote uh, virtual utility, which Nick calls marginal revenue. And so this is something uh, very pedantic, so I, I won't bother. And uh, now, um, it turns out that given the primitives of this model, so here I'm uh, focusing on the main case where there's no issue about excess rights. So it's just purely public good. So given the um, primitives in the model, it turns out that the saddle point condition is both necessary and sufficient for any optimal mechanism. And so one could do this uh, safely. And uh, the so as Nick has already presented that, what that means is that when we, after manipulation, the virtual utility function is now adjusted by the difference of the Lagrange multiplier of the, um, for, for the non uh, for, for the monotonicity condition. And um, so, so I put a lambda here to denote that this is the adjusted uh, virtual utility function. And um, the tractability of this uh, paper uh, stems from the, the structure in the primitive so that the maximization part of this set upon problem uh, can be solved ex explicitly so that the maximum is an explicit function of the adjusted virtual utility function. So in particular, with the first order condition technique, uh, as Nick already mentioned. So the maximization part turns out to be just an explicit uh, function of uh, the adjusted virtual utility function. And then now we just uh, get back to the minimization part of the set of point so that right away we can pin down the uh, virtual utility function corresponding to the optimal mechanism. So it's, it really amounts to that the Lagrange multiplier chooser is choosing a lambda to minimize this max. And whatever that is, would give us the virtual utility function that 
the optimal mechanism can be calculated based on. And, um, and then it turns out that this uh, virtual utility function, uh, uh, given this particular lambda star, um, is indeed uh, ironed in the sense that it's weakly increasing in the, of course it's multi-dimensional, so I'm here abusing language, but we, you know what I mean, and it, so weakly increasing. Um, and, um, it, because if, if not, then the, uh, the corresponding uh, allocation rule would exploit that, and so that th this would violate the monotonicity condition, and then the Lagrange multiplier chooser would uh, exploit that further. Right? So, so that has to be ironed. Now, one could stop. So, a less ambitious author could stop here and say, "Oh, look, I have already figured out what the uh, virtual utility function is uh, that would give rise to the optimal mechanism." Then I'll end the paper, right? But but what the authors of this paper do is that they distill from this uh, more general properties that would get us a new insight, which is something I, I, I learned. And in particular, what they find, uh, they start out by observing that this, um, this particular virtual utility function majorizes the original unadjusted virtual utility function. And so that, is the the main remark they started out. Now, um, I uh, I try to well, uh, try to calculate this myself, given the special case where the lower sets. Uh, so here, by uh, Nick already defined the lower set, so I won't bother. But in my opinion, in a nutshell, it's really the lower higher is just in the sense of strong set order. So suppose the the product space uh, of the type is here, uh, two players, and say that's a full space. Suppose the lower set we are considering is this one. So say X min minus is here. So, it, so really the, the, observation, the observation amounts to really calculating these differences and collapsing them. And eventually it boils down to just the difference between these two Lagrange multipliers. Here, I still have a little bit question about this part. So think of this xi zero as the minimum uh, of uh, player i's um, uh, type space. And in order for this calculation to go through, this has to be zero. I haven't figured out why this has to be zero, um, but uh, I guess it eventually boils down to really my understanding of the difference operator they have. Um, so if this is zero, does that mean that the um, the, uh, the downward incentive compatibility condition of the low of the lowest type, uh, actually I think it's upward, is, is non-binding. But anyway, so that's something uh, is a little thing. And then, so, so that, that's how, anyway, the, the main idea is here. And um, now, um, and then uh, based on that um, observation on majorization, they, um, well, we, we can also, um, uh, that, that's the main thing. And then uh, there are some other properties of this um, uh, V lambda star um, virtual utility function uh, that really is a natural extens multi-dimensional extension of the iron, the virtual utility function that um, we learned from Myerson's paper. Um, and uh, these uh, were already mentioned by uh, Dick. But really, in my opinion, the new thing here though, is that they distill from this property um, that uh, to, to suggest something even more general. So instead of a uh, stop, Stopping at what I suggested earlier and saying, well, look, look by this minim minimization part of set up one problem, we already can, can pin down the, the virtual utility function uh, for which we can, with which we can calculate the optimal mechanism. They are, they are suggesting, they are claiming that this guy really can be equal to this problem, this minimization problem of something that looks a lot simpler. So it's just general G function and um, the only constraint is that this G majorizes the original virtual utility function. Um, and this 
And then from here, they also have a corollary so that the objective can be written as the, um, the, 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 the distance, the Euclidean distance uh, between the original V and this G. But anyway, so, so that comes from here quite obviously. The non-obvious and non-trivial thing to me is that when I look at this equation, this is really not obvious because um, here, the domain here is about G majorizing V uh, but in originally the um, the domain here um, here the domain is that this adjusted lambda adjusted virtual utility function is related to the original virtual utility function in such a way through this lambda. So um, I'm quite convinced that v lambda majorizes the original V, but is the converse true in the sense that um, does every G majorizing V correspond to a particular V lambda? And um, the reason why I'm asking this is that um, because when they are solving this problem, they have to obtain a condition that uh, any solution of this problem is weakly increasing, right? Satisfies the monotonicity. And it appears that um, I might be missing something. It looks like in the proof, the, the argument that this solution uh, is monotone relies on the settle point condition mentioned earlier. But that means you have to have a correspondence between G and, any, and, and V lambda. So maybe it's true, but I do not know enough about the majorization literature to convince myself that uh, we can have such a correspondence for any G majorizing V, maybe, maybe it's a fact. And, um, and then um, there are other claims that the authors has, is, have, uh, they have established that are analogous to the property of uh, what we have earlier here. And uh, these claims are about the properties of the solutions of this problem. And, uh, in, and then given these properties, they prove that if you take any solution of this problem and then construct the optimum allocation based on that solution, then the optimal solution is of the optimal solution for the original problem. And then the, it boils down to proving this equation. And this equation is, while it looks different, it's really the discrete counterpart of uh, Myerson's proof in the section six uh, in the irregular case. A very nice proof here. And uh, so just to elaborate a little bit, um, please stop me, uh, Nick, uh, Vitaly, and uh, if I am running out of your time. Um, no, I mean, everybody can leave whenever they like. So just please finish. Okay, okay. So, um, so a little bit more uh, elaboration. Um, I think here, for example, for this property, they, try, they established that this argmax is, is singleton, so there's only one solution. And uh, there they use, um, they use a property that uh, if, um, uh, if any, so if, if a G is majorizing an H, then H is a mean preserving spread of G. And it's a, it's a very nice uh, way to do, well, of course, in one dimensional case, we all know what that is. But uh, here, they, the authors are dealing with multidimensional case and then they, they build up a procedure to, to do mean preserving spread. So it's kind of cool. Uh, but anyway, um, so that is the counterpart of Myerson's uh, uh, section six uh, proof uh, in the, I, I won't be labeled on it, but uh, I'm just saying that uh, this, so they, um, in a nutshell, Instead of stopping here, the authors propose a novel minimization problem. And it looks more straightforward than the original one because the original one has to deal with the saddle point properties uh, and lambda and so on, so on and so forth. Here, you don't need to deal with lambda, but of course I have a little bit doubt about this, but then probably they will solve that problem later. And, um, and then uh, the, and then the, 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 the point here is that once you solve this problem, whatever, um, whatever uh, minim minimizer you get 
that minimizer turns out to be the iron virtual utility. So I even denote it by this iron form and then, and that would work just as well as uh, what I labeled previously here uh, by following my, uh, this proof. And uh, so that's the their main, in my opinion, their main message and the main takeaway I get from them. And, and this is just a summary. Um, and then now, of course, uh, Nick mentioned that the paper can be extended to the case with excess rice so that, uh, so I don't, I won't be label on it as um, he already said it quite clearly. And uh, the, and also the cost function can be generalized to uh, convex cost, uh, differentiable cost function instead of just the quadratic one. But of course then it's not as clean as before. And also for the excess right, as Nick mentioned, it's not as clean because the this max is inside out, out, rather than outside the sum. And um, they also claim that the, uh, the technique can be extended to continuum type space. So the main idea there is that, uh, in, at the, remember at the beginning when we were talking about the, uh, the discrete counterpart of integration by parts, envelope theorem integration by part. Well, now we really do the uh, envelope theorem integration by parts, uh, except the, it, it, with the complication of uh, multidimensional space. Now, once that is done, then we have to calculate the adjusted virtual utility uh, adjusted by the Lagrange multiplier. Here, I think, uh, unless uh, I might be missing something, because uh, but but looks like that they would rely on the different continuous differentiability of the Lagrange multiplier. But that is an endogenous number, an endogenous variable. So I'm a little bit uncomfortable about that. And um, and also different from the previous case where the settle point condition is necessary for any optimal mechanism. Here, in order for the set point condition to be necessary, we would need quite a few conditions because now we are dealing with a function space. It's not, uh, not, not a finite dimensional space. So that, that can be tricky. Now, even if uh, the set condition is not necessarily necessary, uh, if you can really consider a solution for the set point condition, you still have a, an optimal mechanism. So that, does, that means, um, uh, this method would would still help or would still uh, be useful, I suppose. Um, and but then uh, one would need to make sure that the uh, main problem that they propose later is indeed well defined and indeed would produce a uh, weakly increasing solution. That is the 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 marginal revenue marginal util uh, the virtual utility function is indeed ironed. Uh, so um, I would like to see more details uh, to demonstrate that. Uh, and also their mean preserving spread. I'm actually curious because I, I really like their means, uh, their construction in the appendix. I'm curious how that can be extended to the continuum type space because their con construction there relies heavily on the finiteness of the type space. And uh, so I think that's all that I have. Uh, uh, probably too long winded. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, listening. At the back, the floor is back to you, Vitaly. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Thank you very much. Um, I must say this is the most thorough discussion that I have seen in my career. So thank you for that. Um, I think Nick really appreciates that. Um, um, yeah, so does anyone have any follow-up questions or do you want to comment, Nick, somehow? Uh, no, uh, that's, um, uh, yeah, just thank you, Charles, for the detailed comments, um, and I'll, uh, I'll definitely get back to you about the, uh, um, the correspondence between majorization and uh, the lambda formation. Okay, great. But yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I really enjoy it. It's a challenging paper to read. You know? <laughs> it's not long, but it took me quite a while. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, so thank you everyone to sticking it out to the end. And uh, next time uh, we will meet on November 9th and we will have Douglas Burnett um, uh, presenting. All right. Thank you all. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Nice seeing you, Nick. Yeah, nice seeing you too. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for having me here, guys. 
Oh, no, thank you for discussing. That was yeah. great. Thank you, Charles, for discussing. Thank you, Nick, for presenting.